Uh, yeah, so um, on a pretty much rounded up, what I'm going to do, I've basically got about 60 odd really interesting projects loosely grouped under these kind of headings, and I'm just really going to go through them all and sort of talk about why they're interesting and why they're doing something new or what they're revealing about the world that we haven't previously understood. And just before that, give a little bit of sort of design, history, context for how we've got to this stage where these kind of projects are existing. Let's go. Okay. So, um, you don't get critical design without Dunn and Raby. They invented the term literally, and they're pretty much references the maven of it. They're the heads of the um, RCA Designs Interactions course. Um, in Hertzian and Tails, they, they came up with the term of a critical approach to design, but on their Q&A is perhaps the better definition of it, where they sort of outline what critical design is and what it means. Uh, and you can read that stuff. They also have produced a manifesto about 10 years after Hertzian and Tails, where they took the uh, main principles of what they saw mainstream design on the left and then sort of wrote principles that oppose it, that are just antagonistic to it. And it's not so much about what those principles are because, you know, to be honest, some of them I don't think are even right and some of them I don't really agree with or some of them I think could be done better, but it's simply the fact that they've said that there is a position, right? That it's not just uh, design and technology isn't apolitical. It isn't something that doesn't have an ideology. It has one. And at least if you take a position, you recognize that. What the position is, is it can be very much up to you, but even recognizing that you have to take one is very important. So uh, their most famous piece of work is probably the robot series. Well, one of their most famous pieces of work, one of the ones that's referenced most. And it's straight away it's a provocation, right? Because the title's Robots. When you hear robots, you think of uh, Terminator or AI or Ibo or you know, Asimo or whatever it is. And yet they've got these robots that appear to be things they bought in Muji, right? So, and there's sort of lots of details here and lots of nuances. So the, uh, the black robot, for instance, is a neurotic robot. So it will always look at you, but will move away from you as you try and approach it. The one here on the right that looks a bit like a lamp requires you to constantly wheel it close to a plug socket to plug it in because it's got a very short cable and no sort of wireless capability. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting exploration of what automation means, what robots mean, uh, even in 2007 before we really were you know, getting the level of robotics going on that, is, that we're getting now. And like I say, if you actually Google robots, you get robots. Robots, as you understand, this is what robots should look like. This is how we understand robots. And yet the reality of it is vastly different. This is the uh, most commercially successful robot in Japan, <laughs> right? Years and years, decades. Japan has an aging population problem, and not enough young people look after it. So this is like prime territory for roboticists, to develop a robot that can be a companion and an aid to old people. And Dozens of companies chipped in, spent hundreds of thousands of, uh, of yen doing this, and nothing really came out of it except Paro. It turned out that old people are actually quite proud and quite capable of doing their own things. They just want someone to hang out with. Right? And there's lots of stuff you can read into this about why we've offloaded old people onto bits of electronics and thought that's okay as a culture. Right? That's all right to do. Like It's not a problem. Like, I don't go and visit my grand because she's got a seal with batteries in it. But, <laughs> you know... <laughs> But, but, it, but at some level, it's interesting to think that the reality of this narrative of you know, robots is vastly different. And that applies to all technology. Robots is just you know, a kind of really obvious example of it. Um, another great project that looks at this from, this from a very similar position, but goes a different way of explaining it, is um, Vincent Fournier's Man Machine. He's a fantastic photographer. And he took these sort of prototype robots that all the big Japanese labs were developing and put them in the context in which they were supposed to be in, right? like with people. So there's some of them are in offices, or they're hanging out in the park at lunchtime. And it doesn't work. It doesn't look right. It looks off. It doesn't make sense. Like, the, the robot is fine as long as it's on Google Images. As soon as it's in the real world, it's, it's, it, it doesn't gel with how things should be and how, what we should expect from our technology. And critical design isn't, isn't new, really. Uh, uh, the Italian radicals were doing it in the 60s and 70s, uh, mostly around architecture. Super Studio famously decided that architecture was simply a tool of the markets and the world didn't deserve architecture until it could sort of deal with the, uh, the sort of rampant capitalism that was making design and architecture a tool. So it comes from that heritage of sort of just being uh, rebellious and taking an antagonistic point of view to sort of outline the failings of what the mainstream are, more than anything else. Um, and over the summer, uh, I came across this uh, chart when I was teaching a summer school, and uh, I found it quite interesting. Um, I don't disagree with where critical design is put, <laughs> It's very much about being quite arrogant. It's an expert mindset. It's design-led. You know, there's not much in terms of like, uh, you know, field research or stuff usually involved with it because you're dealing with things that don't exist mostly. But what really interested me was the uh, design and emotion circle, which I suspect is art, but this design sort of think tank couldn't come up with a word for that, so they just called it design and emotion. 
So there's sort of like this idea that, it, it, I mean, much like Julian said, if it's not based around users, it shouldn't be, it doesn't make sense. It should, doesn't fit into the, into the sort of the narrative of technology and design. Uh, so right into it, uh, futures. Most critical design, speculative design, whatever you want to call it, is based around uh, futures. And it's not because we're interested in predicting the future or describing what the future might be. It's because the future is sort of a fertile playground, right? Because it's full of uncertainty, you can invent things and play with things and extrapolate ideas. Uh, and no one can prove you wrong, because you can't go there and check to see if it's happened or not. But, you know, we all know the William Wilson <laughs> quote, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, for those that don't know that. Future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. This is like the, 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 the you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true, right? Uh, the future largely is already here. Someone somewhere in a lab is playing with your future, and you in your pockets have someone else's future, and it'll only be a matter of time until it sort of distributes around this bell curve. Um, and a lot of this way of thinking is, is tied up with foresight tools. I also work in foresight, so I'm familiar with this stuff. This is the uh, futures cone. Um, the, the origin of this is really uncertain. There's been a lot of debate about who actually invented this. Um, this is Dr. Voris's version via Stuart Candy, but I, there might be other versions. But it basically says that um, you know, the further you go into the future, the more uncertain things become, and so you get more chance to play with scenarios or events or technologies and things that you wouldn't possibly normally be able to see. But at the same time, you have um, the preferable future. So this is where marketing lives in here, so like where everything is fine and green. Um, it's probably more going to be here, but there are also little things that we could play with in other spaces to see what that might be like. And so largely a lot of this thinking is about finding a point at a point in the future or whatever on this futures cone. It doesn't even have to be a specific point. And saying, yeah, all right, same tools, same people, but different outcome. What's that like? Um, so uh, this is a good quick example. This is quite old now, actually. This is the old video of Big Dog. Do you, does everyone know what Big Dog is? <laughs> Right, so Big Dog is a, is a military robot uh, that was developed by Boston Dynamics, recently bought by Google last month, which is pretty sinister. It's a military robot, um, and it's designed to basically help troops carry things in the field where uh, wheeled vehicles might not be able to go. And it's actually really scary. The more recent video of it shows it picking up a cinder block, in a, and you think, what's it going to do? And then it throws it across an aircraft carrier, and you're just like, shit, you damn. Because <laughs> it's massive, and it's scary, and it can write itself, and it's kind of glamorous and weird and alien, we don't really understand it. And then this is a, a Photoshop painting that's been going around a lot. Um, I don't know who did this. Artem Shumnik is the original attribution, but I don't, I don't know who that is. But it, suddenly by taking the same object and sort of saying, well, actually in you know, 50, 100 years, this is going to be in the same position that shopping trolleys are now, you completely have a different spin on the politics and the reason for the thing existing in the first place. Like, you know, that glamour is completely stripped away, that scary sort of militaristic uh, uh, image of Big Dog, or scary Google image of Big Dog now. Um, but also counterfactual histories work. This is a, a great project by Sasha Poflet called the Golden Institute, where he looked at an alternative version of history where Carter beat Reagan in the 1980 uh, election in the US and invested a load of money in uh, environmental policies that would uh, still play into the American way of life. So for instance, this car drives around you know, along the, sort of the middle of the desert, picking up lightning bolts from the sky and storing them as energy, and then you deliver it at the nearest town. So also as a counterfactual history to look back and actually say, what if things had been different? What if there was a slight change in, uh, in the way we, we thought or the decisions we made at some earlier time? What might that have turned out like? And what, what sort of objects and sort of images might have come out of that change? Um, this is a project I did where I, uh, I spent a long time researching 2,100 years of power and how that works and how it's been structured historically through uh, religion and technologies and banking and finance and nations and cold wars and all sorts of things, uh, right up to sort of then, um, well, now we're about here. So this bit is all sort of the future, a kind of speculation on what might happen in the future. From that, I started to pick out various different projects and points uh, along it to play with. So first of all is uh, design fictions, which is uh, really hip, right? It's really cool. Um, we all know what design fictions are. This is from. Um, uh, close Encounters, uh, and Dreyf Richard Dreyfus there is building the mesa that the aliens will land on, and it's kind of like a Borgesian map in the territory thing where the model of the mesa gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the it becomes almost the mesa itself. So there's a sort of thing here about projections of the future and how we perhaps build them simply by having a projection anyway. Uh, okay, this is a design fiction. Let's watch. This is Microsoft's Future Vision. They do one of these every year. They do a YouTube video, gets a couple of hundred thousand hits. It's very nice. These kids are really friendly. 
Notice, notice how they don't smudge the glass at all. No Wi-Fi problems, batteries are all good. No connectivity issues. Uh, as Scott Smith would say, he's probably listening somehow. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the key resource of the future is uh, window cleaner. <laughs> she's on a plane, she's looking at, look at all that leather that she's got. Everything's great, everything's fine, right? It's really nice. This is, this is a design fiction, this is a complete fiction. The technology is fabricated. Um, and it's designed, you know, all these interfaces have been designed by designers who design interfaces. Look at that plane. Right. So everyone's happy, it's great. But the, the problem with this is that the people are just props for the technology, right? The technology, the actors and the characters here, the people are just props, the people are incidental. You might as well get rid of the people and just show the technology. Because um, they don't even, you don't even know anything about them. Like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So, two years later, Microsoft's Future Vision. Very similar look. <laughs> yeah. Haven't really moved on. Right? Let's watch. As we watch this, I'm going to read out a list of things. Just bear it in mind. Um, right, OK. So, but t so this is 2011. This is um, July 2011. And the last one was, sorry, pause it, was, uh, we'll go back. The last one was uh, October 20 2009. So it's about, uh, uh, f uh, well, just under two years between them. So in this time, uh, of two years. Uh, the US and UK evacuated nationals from Yemen over terrorist fears. Earthquakes killed 2,000 people in China, 525 people in Chile, 1,400 in Indonesia, two earthquakes in Indonesia, one in late 2009, one in 2010. India also, uh, Indonesia also suffered a volcanic eruption that killed 300. There was that Icelandic volcano that I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of that uh, erupted and grounded flights across Europe. Uh, the Haiti earthquake was particularly memorable, it was 316,000 people killed. Uh, there was an earthquake and a tsunami in Fukushima in Japan, killed 15,000 and led to the meltdown of a nuclear power plant which has now contaminated large parts of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there were revolutions in Kyrgyzstan, Niger and Honduras, there was swine flu. Well there wasn't swine flu was there, there was a hype around the swine flu. Uh, North Korean Navy sinks a South Korean ship killing 46. North Korea decided to shell a load of islands and conducted four nuclear tests. Deepwater Horizon oil platform exploded, killed 11 and the world's largest oil spill. The Greek economy collapsed, leading to riots, the rise of the fascist Golden Dawn movement and successive Euro deals totaling around 200 billion euros. Portugal also received a 78 billion euro bailout. Ireland received an 89 billion euro bailout. Five significant air crashes with casualties of more than 100. Craig Venture invented the world's first synthetic cell. WikiLeaks published 90,000 internal diplomatic cables dealing with the war in Afghanistan. Then 250,000 diplomatic cables sparking diplomatic crises around the world. Floods killed 1,600 in Pakistan, 903 in Rio, 850 in Thailand. Uh, displaced 12 million in Thailand as well, 500 in Taiwan. December 2010 saw the beginning of the Arab Spring. There were revolutions in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, the Yemen, the Syrian civil war that began in March 2011. Major protests in Bahrain, Algeria, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Morocco, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Osama bin Laden was killed in Pakistan. The Arab Spring also spiked oil prices by 20%. Uh, Anders Breivik killed 77 people in Norway. There were 19 mass school shootings in the US that killed 75 people. Mars Curiosity gathered evidence of possible liquid water on Mars. Occupy Wall Street began in September 2011, a month before the release of this video. And by the time of its release, the movement had spread to 82 countries. In the UK alone, we had the Iraq War Inquiry, the riots, the student protests and the riots from them, our own branch of our Occupy, the phone hacking scandal, which uh, resulted in the prosecution of uh, News International and the recent Leveson stuff, uh, shutting down of the news of the world, uh, super injunction scandal, and the MP expense, expense scandal. So all that stuff happened in two years, and yet the, the image of the future hasn't changed? Like, what's wrong with this picture where that, that has no effect, like global political chaos? Um, so is it a good design fiction? It is. It's a really good design fiction because if you're a Microsoft shareholder, you're probably giddy as hell over this, right? It's just amazing. But if you're a real person who's ever experienced any sort of human error or problem, then it's rubbish. Like, it's just appalling. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's design fiction, but design fiction is just a tool. It's not actually an ideal or a way of thinking about things. So you can use it to deceive people and sell stuff that doesn't exist, or you can use it to talk about real problems. This is another really good, bad design fiction. And I'm going to see if anyone knows already or is, can spot the reason why. If you can spot the reason why it's such a good, bad design fiction. OK, Glass, record a video. Yeah? Leave it for a bit. This is it. We're on in two minutes. Oh. A 
Okay, Glass. Hang out with the Flying Club. Apart from the fact that suddenly when you have Google Glass, you like sculpt ice and fly small planes. Mm. Sculpt ice and tigers. You ready? Right there. Okay, Glass. Take a picture. <laughs> right? Any any guess what it is? The reason why this is such a, a good, bad design fiction is that apart from that guy in a trapeze artist, no one else is wearing Google Glass. Like, you are the only person in the world that has Google Glass. And there's, there's so many reasons you can read into that. There's all sorts of stuff about the gays and all sorts of stuff. But it fundamentally is because Google Glass is an ugly, hideous, uncomfortable object that we don't want to have in our lives. So the only way you can sell it is by saying that your vision is important and everyone else is just sort of a pleb in this system. Anyway, moving on. So, uh, and then there's this question of where the border between design fiction and science fiction exists, right? So Minority Report was a highly designed film. They had professional interface designers who came in and designed it. And there's lots of interesting stuff about how uncomfortable that interface was to use and the fact that Tom Cruise had to take a break every 10 minutes because his arms were about to drop off, right? <laughs> But the problem with things like this is that they've done more for technology journalism than a decade of CES conferences. <laughs> even, like, even like 10 years later, we're still getting closer to Minority Report, which is 10 <laughs> years earlier. <laughs> uh, we haven't literally got out of this all. It's, seriously, I just searched Minority, like something out of Minority Report on Google in the first 10 hits, right? This was last year's CES. Um, on and on and on and it goes. Um, so what's a good design fiction? Well, would you believe it, David Chang, nod to you for this one. Um, the BT, uh, the uh, BT and the post office invented Skype in 1964. Watch. I'll see you tonight then. Yes, all right. Now I said I'd come, didn't I? Wish I could see you now. Well, you can't, can you? You just have to wait. <laughs> but supposing the telephone could provide vision as well as sound, then he could see her now. Wouldn't that be better? Yes, marvellous. <laughs> but whether we should always want vision or not, what kind of facilities can we expect in the next generation? Worldwide communication, of course. Hello, Bill. This is it. This is Henry. Who? Who did you say? Henry. Right. I'm calling from London. That is why this is a brilliant design fiction. The first thing that happens as soon as he uses this brand new... Right, this, is like the, this is like the gramophone of the time, right? This is like the hippest, coolest bit of technology. The, the reason it's brilliant, the reason it's such a good design fiction is the fact the first thing that happens is it doesn't work. <laughs> right? He answers the brand new Skype from 1964 and the other person on the other end of the line going, who? I can't hear. It's breaking up. <laughs> Because that's what happens. It doesn't work, right? It shouldn't work. This is a, a conscious design fiction, near future laboratory. They are the godfathers of design fiction, really the, the genius of it. Everything, they, you know, they run that show. Um, and this is a great clip, a great film called Corner Convenience, which is a couple of small vignettes about a future convenience store. I'm just going to show you perhaps uh, my favorite of them. Hey, motherfucker. Hey. Right, so, yeah, there you go. You know, that, and that's just 
brilliant. So, you know, if you're going to sell contactless payment to someone, sell it to them that way, right? I mean, it's, it's real. It's convenience stores, you go back 20 years, convenience stores, corner shops look the same as they do now, right? So it's just you, selling the sort of hyper-manufactured, smooth, plastic vision of the future is just a deception. Uh, which leads me on to normalcy. There's a lot of stuff here, but I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip to uh, Nick Foster's uh, thing on normalcy. He wrote an excellent, um, excellent piece on Core 77 called the, the Future Mundane, where he laid out some principles for designing for the future. Uh, one, the future mundane is filled with background talent. Stop designing for heroes. They're not real, and even if they are, they fall right outside the bell curve. Again, bear this in mind for the next bit. He goes on, uh, perhaps we should look past Bruce Willis and design for man at bus stop, girl at bar, or taxi driver. While this approach is less aspirational or sexy, those characters are much closer to the humans who you are telling your story to. When your goal is not entertainment, you don't need a hero. Number two, the future mundane is an accretive space. This is perhaps the most interesting. The future isn't just new technology, an LED television atop a vintage table, a PlayStation next to a 60s vase, an iPad in a leather bag. If industrial design is in the business of making stuff, then we need to understand that this stuff piles up for Vela-like. And third, the future mundane is a partly broken space. For every miraculous iPad, there are countless partly broken realities, Wi-Fi passwords, connectivity, battery life, privacy, and compatibility, amongst others. The real skill of creating a compelling and engaging view of the future lies not in designing the gloss, but in seeing beyond the gloss to the truths behind it. So it's a very simple sort of set of rules of understanding that technology, the future doesn't just happen at once. It sort of grows over time. And again, back to the, the Gibson quote, you've got some bits that are hundreds of years old and some bits that are brand new. So diegetic prototypes, that's the other big one. This is... Uh, Again, Kubrick invented the iPad in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Very few people give him credit for that, but he did. Um, and also a really good toilet. You can check out the film. Uh, Bruce, uh, originally it was, it was uh, a filmic idea, so talking about how uh, props are designed for films as prototypes to expand on the world that's off camera. However, it was then brought into design terminology, uh, partly by Bruce Sterling's effort in working with David Kirby to bring it into that. Um, and if we look at children and men, this is perhaps one of the greatest examples of, of diegetic pro, uh, prototyping that exists. Everything in every shot talks a little bit about the world that uh, children and men is in, which is very similar to current Britain, actually, so that's kind of nice. Right? So even like the fact that they've recreated the Pink Floyd album cover above Fantasy Power Station and built their own bridge just says a lot about the way that power has been reconstructed for the film, such that the writers of the film don't have to have you know, the Star Wars style you know, in the history of this film. There was dot, 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 and this is where we are now. Uh, so in design terms, this is a great uh, example of diegetic prototyping. This is a project I worked on with um, Tony, and Fiona, uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby, uh, United Micro Kingdoms. And what they did is they wanted to, t they took like an ideological matrices of uh, really extreme ways of thinking about statehood and then constructed four nations out of them. And that's a complex thing to do because obviously nations are comprised of loads and loads of different things. So in order to quite simply talk about these different nations in an exhibition context, they wanted to describe how their transport system would work. So simply by making cars or trains or whatever from a nation, you're actually given an insight into the ideology behind that entire nation. This is the uh, digitarians, for example, where their entire social structure is run by algorithm. And so the cars are structured for, for pure efficiency. And they're all, they're all uh, driverless cars, they're all robotic. Everything is geared towards efficiency and lowering processing power and making sure that uh, you get sort of as much priority as possible in this sort of endlessly algorithmically uh, mediated state. Um, this is also a good example. This is Life Support by Revital Cohen, now one half of uh, Cohen Van Balen. Uh, it's a really great example of uh, the way I interpret design to be as well, because uh, in the words of Benedict Sim Singleton, uh, design is a trap, um, and it's a rearranging of uh, various factors and um, criteria that we already understand to, to develop a new outcome, right? So in this instance, uh, dogs chase rabbits. Uh, when the dog chases a rabbit, its blood flow increases, you attach that to a, um, I forgot the name of it, dialysis machine, and then you plug that into someone who needs kidney dialysis. The three things themselves are understood entirely, but you put them together and you end up with a brand new proposal for an outcome. He explains it as, uh, the trap may involve the application of force in both its construction and operation, but it has the characteristic of applying this force with sophistication, which obtains in the way that this force is highly considered to leverage environmental tendencies that already exist. Design is therefore less about creating new things so much as rearranging things we already have for new and unexpected outcomes. This is uh, the property program. Andrew Friend and Petrarca did this uh, in a residency at, uh, somewhere in California. And they wanted to criticize uh, or to critique scientific language and how scientific language can be used to kind of 
obfuscate findings and, and sort of almost deceive uh, objective truth in a way. So they created a, an experiment based on a paper that already exists whereby uh, these white panels shoot air at someone standing between them. And in the paper that they produced, they said, the, the paper that was produced for this experiment, not their version of this experiment, said that people could predict which one of the panels it was going to come out of. But it turned out that it was simply due to the design of things like the panels and the, the, the way that the, the equipment worked and the way that people were brought into it, that it was actually quite easy to guess which one it was going to come out of. Um, that's just a trailer for it. It's worth checking out. But they were inspired particularly by the Milgram experiment, which is another case of design being used to deceive people and force behavior. Does it, do people know about the Milgram experiments? Uh, well, so the, the Milgram experiments were uh, uh, two, uh, one person who assumed that they were doing the test was actually the test subject. They were put in a room and forced to electrocute someone in another room under orders, right? Uh, and uh, this, I think the, uh, they predicted that only 3% of people would go to a lethal amount of electricity, and actually 65% of people did. And that was mostly down to the design of the equipment that they were using with these very linear switches. It's very easy just to move your finger along a centimeter and flick another switch, right, while a person on the other side of a sheet of glass is screaming in agony. It wasn't, they weren't really being electrocuted. The person on the other side of the glass was an actor, but they didn't realize that. And this was kind of uh, inspired by why um, so many of the Nazi officers in the Nuremberg trials were saying, I was just following orders. They were sort of saying, well, how far would you go to follow orders? And it turns out 65% of the way. Um, another great piece of diegetic prototype, this is Philip Ronnenberg, recent graduate of RCA's Design Interactions, post-Cyber War series. It's really excellent. He wanted to look at alternative um, networks and way of doing things, and he came up with these three small scenarios. Quite humorous, quite clever. On the left, the uh, internet is actually uh, teletext. It's just replaced by the internet, so we don't have the internet as we know it. Uh, the top right one there, that's GPS, but it uses open source seismic detectors instead of uh, military satellites. And on the bottom right, the cloud is actually de de uh, data encoded into DNA and dumped in the sewers um, that you then drag up when you want information, right? <coughs> so it's a way of sort of talking about more humorous and not potentially, well, I think they all work, actually, so apart from the DNA one. But um, although maybe, right? I don't know. Just be careful next time you flush. Um, <laughs> So uh, they all work, but it's all very interesting. It's provoking at the fact, much like Julian and, and Daniel were talking about, that the things you take for granted is the infrastructure that's invisible, right? Uh, and that you don't see this. You only see the interface and the outcome. And as soon as you start to say to someone, well, actually, you know, what if the internet was on teletext and you know, directed over TV radio waves instead? How would that affect you? You'd have lower bandwidth, but potentially it's sort of also in more of a public domain, potentially. Uh, agents of fear, another good section. A lot of um, existential terror in the 21st century discovered. Um, uh, drones are often a uh, du jour subject of talking about simply because, uh, to quote James Bridle, sorry, it's probably paraphrasing actually more than quoting, it's uh, the physical, physicalization of a very long, sharp, dangerous digital stick. Um, so it's not so much about the object of the drone itself as the system and the sort of the way that the politics and technology have become related and travel together through, through uh, post-Cold War history that result in this physical object. That was the outcome of this relationship. But this is the love child of Western politics and the internet. Um, so this is uh, Drone Shadow, which he's, he does a series of these. He just released the uh, book, so anyone can make them, where he was interested in the fact that we're quite distant from the physical uh, embodiment of these drones. We see pictures of them, and it turns out a lot of those images are renderings anyway. They're not even real. Whoop, go back. Um, and so he, he, he went into a car park near his studio, and he plotted out the size of it, and was actually like, holy shit, these things are massive. Like, they're the size of... Learjets almost, or small planes. They're, and people don't really realize that. They don't realize the scale of it because it's something that's kept so distant. It's behind windows and screens, or it's on news stories. And so literally, uh, in this case, it was just up the road from the White House. And just to bring that physical presence into uh, our world. Drone Instagram is, a, is another one of his where um, he was interested in tracking the drone strikes that were happening all the time. Um, but expressing them in a way that we could access, because although these drone strikes are happening all the time, they kind of blend into the background noise of the ongoing things like war on terror or whatever it is. And so we don't really experience them directly. But by putting them on Instagram, which is a format that everyone's familiar with and everyone knows, it's kind of very much throwing it up into the pop culture sphere. And so he would take the positions of where these drone strikes were happening and then find as best he could where it was on Google Earth, take a screen grab and then post it to Instagram, and it became a huge hit. And I think tens of thousands of followers, maybe, James? 10,000 10, followers. <laughs> 10 followers, not that big. I thought it was really, po I thought it was really popular. No? 
Oh, well, okay. Uh, and new aesthetics as well was uh, James's work. This was, um, uh, and I, I'm probably going to get this wrong and it's going to be really difficult, right? Oh, God, sorry, okay. <laughs> so, uh, for, well, for me, this is very much about when, when designers talk about relating to the digital, it's very much how to put humans in the digital, right? How to make something, how to make the digital friendly to us, right? How do we intervene in this? Thing. Um, whereas, in fact, the digital has been intruding on the physical since it's existed, um, and it's just been sort of bubbling up underneath and, you know, turning up in things like fashion and, uh, you know, fine art and stuff like that, and architecture, and it's sort of just appearing anyway of its own accord in a language that we don't quite understand but we recognise. And so James started this project, a, a, a Tumblr essentially, and a couple of talks and bits of writing to kind of try and log the instances of where these, these border crossings were happening between the digital and the physical. Little printer, Berg, not going to go on about it. Um, <laughs> uh, um, it's, it's not actually, it is, is this an object of fear? I'm not sure. It was, it's, it's very difficult for me to deal with this. It makes me quite angry as a, as a thing um, in itself. Essentially, Berg originally, as far as I understand it, proposed this as a critical object. It wasn't a consumer gadget. It was sort of saying, we're now dealing with this language and this idea of the Internet of Things where we're going to invite devices into our home that other people control. Right, so you're going to have a fridge that orders food for you, but so at some point that goes through a server, that goes to a supermarket. This supermarket have a log of everything you eat, your dietary requirements, whether you're healthy or unhealthy, whether you need medication. And so this was like a small foray into that. It's just a little harmless thing, actually. In itself, it's relatively harmless. It just prints news. But they did something last year where they changed the haircut on the little face. And this was kind of a bit, you know, it seems really innocuous and who cares, but actually it was kind of significant because you have no control over that. They've just done that from their server. Essentially, even with Little Printer, it's two guys in an office in Shoreditch who control everything that goes onto it, which is, you know, okay, but, you know, how are we, how are we feeling about that? I got in trouble. <laughs> uh, space is the place. This is good. I love space projects. Big fan of space. Um, I love the fact that when NASA cut funding, um, almost every corporation in the world jumped to attention and started trying to buy up space. So it's brilliant. Um, and we're all going to end up there someday. And for the first time in history, space isn't for guys with three PhDs in quantum physics who spend 12 hours a day in the gym. Space is now for, supposedly for everyone. We're all going to go there. We're all, all going to benefit from it, at least. Um, Vincent Fournier, again, space project, went to um, one of the NASA facilities and took lots of pictures. And they're kind of uh, moving and artistic more than design. But um, they sort of show how kind of ramshackle space flight is. It's not that high tech and, and neat. It is just guys hoping for the best. It's very touch wood, cross fingers. <laughs> we'll make it, it'll be all right, nothing will blow up. And it, it's, so there's a lot of weakness there, there's a lot of fallibility. And so, but he wasn't criticizing that, he was admiring how, how much these guys are willing to take as uncertainty. And there are all sorts of statistics about what classifies for a risk and what doesn't in NASA, but fundamentally even an image like this, this pure sort of scale of this endeavor is sort of revealed, I think. Um, is it into orbit? Joseph Popper, graduate of the RCA Design Interactions Project uh, program. Sorry. Try a quick bit of this. I think I'm running. I'm doing all right. Actually. Pretty funny, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, he's dealing with a lot of interesting things. His sort of byline is zero gravity on zero budget. He's really interested. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it's not obvious, is it, right? It doesn't say no. Um, his, his thing is like dealing with the, the sci fi imagery of space. <laughs> the sci fi imagery of space versus the realities of space flight um, and how those two things match up. And also, a real, you know, he has a real personal vested interest in space. Um, and so for him, he does actually want to try and experience these things. We've done a couple of projects, a couple of short films, all about sort of the, the realities of space, but not in a very glamorous sci-fi way, but in a very sort of, I'm a normal person, I want to be in space, what does that mean, how do I get there? Um, and you probably need better shoes than that, I would imagine. Right? They're not going to do you much good. Anyway, uh, this is, oh, Larissa Sensor, Space X. So this is a pretty famous film. 
it's pretty short. What's interesting to me about it, it's, uh, well, it's about a Palestinian who lands on the moon, essentially, is, is the film. Um, what's interesting to me is not so much the aspect of space, but the fact that she's almost suggesting the only way Palestine gets recognized as a country is by putting a flag on the moon. Right? Palestine, deeply political thing, but suddenly if Palestine goes to the moon and has a flag there, does that give it statehood? Does that transcribe state? Is it achieved enough technology at this stage? Pretty convincing. It's almost as if the moon landing was faked. Um, right. Anyway, moving on. Uh, this is a great book. Ships not shelter. Let's get the fuck off Earth by the uh, Peckham Outer Space Initiative. It's a really nice book. It's very graphical. Uh, it's kind of a, a manifesto for like um, you know how we've become too compl complacent and too comfortable in being still and like sitting in houses and permanent dwellings, and that we need to get used to moving and transportation. Very much fits into the accelerationist sort of canon of. Um, Know, leaving Earth instead of trying to deal with problems. Well, dealing with the problems by leaving Earth, perhaps, as well. Um, another great uh, project, Afronauts. Afrofuturism is, is quite um, uh, controversial at the moment, I would say. There's a lot of debate over this. But this idea that you know, uh, space travel is a, a Western thing, predominantly American, also the Russians, I suppose, as well. But it's got a, it's got a very set, set um, imagery that we take for granted. And this was based on an entirely true... Um, project from uh, Zambia in 1964 where they set up a space program, which was um, a girl, an oil barrel, and two dogs. And that was the Gambian space program in 1964. But then she took this, um, this story that she found and, and sort of followed through with it and said, well, what if they continued with the space program? What if they putting the girl in the barrel and rolling it down the hill led to spaceflight? Um, what would that look like? What would African spaceflight look like? Um, it's quite interesting, and she's, there's now a film about it that's been kick-started. It's all going to go off. It's going to be quite interesting. Uh, the Welsh Space Camp Campaign by Heffin Jones. I saw this um, this year at the Goldsmith Design Show, and it was it was absolutely excellent as a as a project. Uh, and again, it's one of those projects. Although it uses space as a vehicle, it's not so much about space. It's about the sort of the national projectness of space. The fact that you know, I guess in my interpretation, we're losing a lot of national projects. We're becoming very broken up and privatized and corporate focused. And so to unify Wales, which is you know, is it English? Is it British? Is, well, it's not English, but is it in Britain? <laughs> What's its unique heritage? Where is it from? To actually say, actually, let's have a new project. Let's have a space campaign. So um, all the materials for this spacesuit and for the, the campaign and the facilities and stuff are all Welsh or manufactured in Wales, and they all come from um, yeah, Welsh sources. So it's really interesting as a look at, at space, not just as a technology, but also as something to aim towards as a national project. Uh, which brings me on to materials. That's the Blackbird SR-71 in the background, my favorite single uh, thing ever made. Um, it's a U.S. spy plane that was made entirely from Russian titanium. <laughs> so they imported Russian titanium to build a spy plane. Brilliant. And there's so many good stories about it. 3D printing is obviously the thing right now. This is some 3D printing. <laughs> <laughs> good. There's some more. It's bits of a gun. It's pretty good. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, so also, but the thing is, yeah, so 3D printing is... is at an early stage, it's start, well, it's now starting to get into use. Formula One teams are using it and stuff to manufacture parts, but it still hasn't become this massively domestic thing. It, we still haven't really had a third industrial revolution. The people in this room, maybe, but not like in the real world, where you know quadrant one stuff, where they're actually dealing with um, real problems. Um, <laughs> uh, so Marcus Kaiser in apparently 2011, yeah. <laughs> Futurism uh, did this uh, project solar synth, which I'll just play a bit. Um, but the point was, it took 3D printing into the technology, but uh, the thing uses um, a lens to focus light from the sun onto sand, which melts it into glass, and then the tray moves around to form an object. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether this works or not. Um, I've seen objects that have come off it, and they're a bit, they're not obviously not great quality, but I, I believe that it actually works. And actually does it. But the point of this is, he's sort of saying, the place where 3D printing is going to be useful are places where there's a lot of sand and a lot of sun and not much else. So this is kind of an interesting look, not so much at the technology itself, but how the deployment of this technology opens up new opportunities and new, new ways of doing things. Uh, back home, Matthew Plummer Fernandez's Disarming Corruptor. Did Disarming Corruptor, pretty good, all right. Um, Disarming Corruptor, it's actually called. Uh, he was, you know, if essentially you take 3D printing, you add NSA surveillance, you have to find a way to encrypt objects now, not just words and images. And so he invented this um, encryption program that you put in a 3D mesh, 
you put in some encryption parameters and you, you develop a, a key and the object and you send them both to the intended recipient and then they re, re undo it at the other side. Um, the thing I like about it the most though is although that's really clever and really useful, it actually produces really beautiful objects um, as a, as a um, program. It sort of corrupts standard downloaded objects and makes something new and there's also interesting questions over copyright and stuff. If you download uh, a 3D object that's copyrighted and then you uh, corrupt it, does that still retain the copyright or does it not? You know, because essentially if that was, you know, a 3D printed Mickey Mouse that's been corrupted, is it still a 3D printed Mickey Mouse or is it something new? Um, and then uh, away from 3D printing to normal manufacturing, this is Thomas, how am I doing for time? Okay, Thomas Thwaites' toaster project, uh, 2010, this is a pretty famous project as well, where he made a toaster, that's basically it. He made, a to he made everything though, like he didn't just go and get the components, he like smelted the metal and made the plastic in a microwave in his garden, right? Um, because he went to Argos and a toaster costs eight pounds. Uh, and he was like, how, do, how, you know, how much of the manufacturing chain, how much of the value chain is obscured that this incredible object comes out of one end at eight pounds? So this cost him 5,000 pounds and took nine months. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't even fucking work. Right? <laughs> but that was the point he was making. You know, it's, it's just a beautifully simplistic way of saying, actually, there's some other photos of it where he lays out all the components of the toaster. Actually, this isn't just a single object. It's a whole load of histories and processes and manufacturing techniques and skills and people that go towards this incredibly cheap, incredibly impressive object. Um, equally humorous uh, uh, <laughs> error, error for error by Jeremy Hutchinson. He wrote, uh, he wrote emails to a load of big manufacturers, manufacturers in China and asked them to produce intentionally faulty objects. So, so there's like a garden forks without blades, there's cheese graters without any grating capability, all sorts of things. The, the brilliant thing about this project, which unfortunately I can never show on screens because it's too small, is the email conversations he has with the manufacturers. Right, because there's, he, just even sort of trying to break this relationship, you know, because normally they get an email from someone saying, I need 200 cheese graters. They don't get one, so they need 200 cheese graters that can't possibly work. <laughs> so the Chinese factory owners are just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so there's some really great conversations. It's all on his website. It's worth checking out just to see how these conversations developed. Um, 75 Watt by Cohen Van Balen um, is also a really good project. Uh, recently uh, released and been touring around and stuff. They invented an object that serves the simple function of forcing the people assembling it to perform a dance. Um, so it's a choreographed object. That's all it does. It has no function. It's called 75 watts. It uses 75 watts of power, but it doesn't do anything. Um, but it, it forces them to make these movements. And it's brilliant. And it's much like um, Thomas Thwaites' toaster project, it's talking about all the things that are hidden, all the sort of processes. You know, when you buy an object, you're essentially choreographing a production line. In some way, um, the whole film is about 15 minutes. This is just a trailer. It's worth checking out. Um, it's on show all over the place. I think. Have to move on. Transhumanism, uh, another big one in terms of technology. Um, moving quickly through. No, you're not going to go next. Okay, Choi, Choi Car Fires prospects us for a future body. Uh, another RCA Design Interactions graduate. He. Um, uh, scanned 3D models of, of like kind of famous dancers from YouTube and stuff and then plugged electrodes onto a dancer and forced them to recreate it. Um, so the dancer's not actually willfully moving, it's just electrodes forcing muscles to compress and, and um, move in time. And it's really fascinating, and he, he performs it live with, with various dancers and various people, but the, the great thing about it is the element of control and who's running this show. Like, is it, is it the original dancer from YouTube? Is it Choi? Who, is, uh, who wrote the program, or is it the person who is a puppet for a load of electronic signals? Um, it's an interesting question to deal with. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Mr. Strange Machine, this is um, Sputniko Hiro Miyazaki, who is now um, a professor at MIT. Strangely. Um, so the, the one thing about her work is that she creates these objects, these speculative objects. This is a menstruation machine that forces, forces men to experience a period. But at the same time, um, she plays with Japanese pop culture. Here she is as a woman playing a man who cross-dresses as a woman in a Japanese pop song. And she's actually quite famous in Japan. She gets a lot of gigs and stuff. So she's very clever in that she's layering up sort of different attacks on different things. The attacks on sort of Japanese sexuality, attacks on sort of Japanese pop culture, and also attacks on you know, the, the general role between men and women. It makes these really catchy pop songs. So almost every project ends in a pop song. And they're all on YouTube, you should check out. 
Uh, Agatha Haynes' um, transfiguration, she took um, uh, this idea that we're now approaching an age where we can choose the traits that our children will have and kind of extrapolated it to insanity. Um, the chap there on the bottom left, he has bigger cheeks so that he can be a better businessman because it means he'll be able to absorb more coffee, right? Um, <laughs> the guy on the top left is, is streamlined. He's going to be an Olympic swimmer. Uh, the one on the top right, they're cooling flaps on the head. And on the bottom left, this is so that uh, the child gets infected with a worm that it pulses its immune system. So, it, you know, there's all sorts of stuff about, I want my baby to look like and be rich and tall and healthy, dot, dot, dot. But also, if you're really extreme, if you're a really psychotic parent, how far would you go? Like, um, and these are really realistic and they're really impressive. She has a, an incredible skill for making um, very lifelike uh, sculptures and models and stuff. And worth checking out. Um, Liam Young, Specimens of Unnatural History. Oh, dang, okay. Uh, he... Um, speculated about a sort of future or maybe even a present Galapagos Islands where a lot of technology washed up on a shore is actually taken up by the animals who live there and the animals start to adapt themselves and evolve with the technology and a brand new ecosystem sort of comes out of it. Really fascinating project that he set up as sort of taxidermied animals and, and still lifes and stuff. It's really beautiful. Um, I Hasegawa, I want to deliver a shark. She's Japanese. It's a Japanese project. <laughs> um, they're all a bit mad. Um, so she basically said... Um, uh, humans, too much population of humans, lots of endangered species. If you want a child, why not give birth to an endangered species? <laughs> That's logical, right? That's fine. That's fine. So she's been doing this project in various iterations for the last few years, and she's just done a brand new iteration of it. Um, and it's all based in science. She, 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 spent, she collaborates with um, scientists at Imperial College, I think, maybe around the world now, on actual ways that this could be possible, how you could replace the womb with sort of a saline base and all sorts of things like that. Um, and it's quite po faced you know, it's very humorous, but at the same time, it's actually saying, you know, overpopulation, endangered species, come on, um, get it together. Uh, so also then, um, synthetics is the other thing. This was like this, so you can kind of say there are three waves of critical design. The first wave was the digital, the second wave was uh, this, is synthetic biology, and the third wave is almost about big design, states, nations, societies, things like that. So in synthetic biology, there are various different um, exciting projects that are going on. This is one of mine. Um, which was a documentary about uh, the Mumbai slums where they'd appropriated a strain of mushroom that grew, uh, that grew really large and was able to produce power like a potato clock. And again, it's based on real science. It's based on some work that was done by some Slovakian uh, scientists in 2009. But I was trying to talk about how the kind of super white, clean uh, image we have of how science is disseminated through GlaxoSmithKline or whatever uh, could actually be challenged by the actual real needs of people who genuinely suffer from things. So there's a whole story here. There's like a, a nine-minute documentary um, all about how it gets through sort of uh, black market systems and, and gang networks into the slums where it's kind of utilized to its utmost. Uh, this is a great project, George Tremel and Shiho Fukuhara. This is, was on is on exhibition in uh, Ars Electronica at the moment, Common Flowers. They took a strain of um, purple chrysanthemum which were genetically engineered uh, to become purple, or they were bred to become purple, rather. And now they're trying to breed them back to being white. So they're basically cross-breeding a copyrighted flower back to an uncopyrighted flower. And it's really fascinating. And if you talk to them, they're in constant legal battles with someone or, or, or whoever over this. There's all sorts of details. Like, once the flower's cut, it's dead, and so it's okay to play with, but they only have a short window in which they can get... Um, stuff they can use to sort of cross-fertilize another generation. And every show they do, they do another generation. So they're on something like their 12th or 13th generation at the moment in working back towards the original, uh, the original flower. Um, and it's just fascinating. It's an, it's a, an expose of sort of the fact that synthetic biology isn't a science. It's also a really complex legal set of frameworks. Um, and having done synthetic biology shows a lot, I know how difficult they can be because they're very real legal issues to go through. Um, yeah, that's sort of the latest culture that they're doing at the moment. So generally when they do a show, they just have all these bottles of them growing a new culture. Um, David Benke, The New Weatherman, this is another great um, project about uh, synthetic biology and genetic engineering. He was interested in taking the middle road between uh, really pro-GM and pro-engineering stuff and, and anti-GM. Like what's the middle way between those two things? Because you basically have those two arguments and neither of them are entirely correct. They're both sort of highly propagandized. Um, and so he invented a uh, fictional terrorist movement that uses synthetic biology technology to disrupt um, capitalist systems. Uh, so, for instance, the one on the right is a, uh, is a strong strain of diesel bug, which is a real bacteria that infects uh, diesel and diesel tanks and then spreads through cars when they uh, plug in to get petrol and spreads back into petrol tanks. So it starts to <coughs> corrode, um, corrode petrol. 
the one on the left is a, um, a strain of palm oil that forces you to throw up and pool up. Uh, which, because palm oil is really destructive, the farming of palm oil in South America is, is a real massive problem e ecologically and politically. And so it's a way of sort of weaning the Western world off palm oil. Uh, and the one at the front in the middle that you can't quite see is, is actually my favorite. It's a device that grows, uh, blows um, viruses across golf courses to, to destroy the grass. Because <laughs> golf course grass is all copyrighted, right? It's all the, the genes are all copyrighted, so it sort of disrupts it and throws in loads of new strains and cuts them up and breaks it up. It's quite busy. Um, and then the, finally, the last section is the new geopolitics. This is where I, I as a, as a uh, practicing designer and artist, work most is in this sort of field around um, thinking about new geopolitics. <laughs> So um, this was a story I did in 2000, uh, sorry, a project I did in 2012 called 88.7. I was learning a lot about the 2008 financial crises and the ones that went before it. And I kind of just did a big, okay, screw it. Let's see what happens. Like, let's see if every, you know, all the, all the high speed trading, all the high finance guys, if they're all right, right, if this is the savior of civilization, let's sort of follow it through logically and see where we ended up. So I sort of went on a mental journey through different iterations of, the ideologies and the technologies that we could expect to evolve and arrived at a bank on a boat and sort of just said, okay, this is cool, this is a good object. Uh, and the bank circumnavigates the world 88.7 degrees uh, up in the North Pole, which allows it to go around once every 24 hours and not just as a sort of station, but also as a way of um, breaking out of legal constraints around states and nations and when you can trade and when you can't trade and how much and how little. So it's kind of reaching this logical endpoint of an object or an image that could be used to talk about the the politics that um, today and at the time were, were pretty much dominant, fiercely dominant in the debates we were having about the way the world was going. Um, this is uh, Commoditized Warfare by Yosuke Oshigomi. This is um, a very recent project and it's um, one of my favorite of the recent RCA grad projects. He uh, wanted to look at how you could have warfare without hurting people, how you can make warfare into a kind of sport. If you, you're not gonna be able to get rid of inter-country competitiveness, but at least you could constrain it in a place where no one gets hurt. Um, so in the instance of uh, these two lorries in the front, they meet on the Pakistan-Indian border and two guys do a sword dance over them and then go their own way at the end of it. Um, and you can kind of see them blurry in the background doing the dance. Uh, the one on the left is a baseball field where North Korea and South Korea can play baseball against each other quite happily. But the, the best thing about this project isn't just the design of the objects, it's also that they're presented as models. They're not presented as like architectural models of a real thing. They are presented quite openly as toys. Um, and he's really playing into the language around how we uh, sort of worship uh, military technology. You know, we have model planes, model boats. You know, I'm obsessed with the Blackbird SR-71. We all have that kind of, we buy into this commodification of weapons. Um, and so he, he shows that by making them into toys, not just sort of architectural models of real things. Uh, Intel Cypress merger, Zoe Papadopoulou, 2011. Um, that pretty much explains it. Right, so if Intel bought Cyprus, Cyprus was in the height of an economic crisis. If Intel bought Cyprus, what would happen to Cyprus? Um, so she designed a uh, monument. She designed a uh, sort of branding of sweets and a new flag and everything. And she went through this and logically presented it and came up with this Intel Cyprus country. It's very complex, it's not that much different. Um, it's very complex and it's very much worth um, watching the small film she made about it. To, that kind of explores what the changes are when you know, na uh, nations are quite openly bought out by corporations. Uh, and there they are, the Stacktivists. And so <laughs> these are the Stacktivists who are here with us today, Haven A, um, who uh, talk um, a lot about how these different systems are layered and integrated and what they're for and who controls them and what our points of intervention are on them. Um, there's, it's not a lot of projects yet coming out of this, but it's very important. It's a very important way of thinking. It's a very important way of talking about the fact that there are no independent systems anymore. There are no networks that aren't connected to another network that aren't controlled at some point that we can't quite see. Um, uh, Jay calls this the ways not to die, right? Um, so there, is, there are six ways you can be killed and all of them are controlled somewhere by a corporation. Um, and you have to now find your own way out of that. Uh, and then finally, this is, oh, it's not fine, not quite finally. Okay, this is one of my projects, very quickly. Uh, uh, I looked at a town that was um, contracted by a brand new Chinese corporate city to do all the labor for that town. So you actually separate labor and the physicality of the place and you put the labor somewhere else and then you achieve the capitalist dream which is all the labor with none of the workers. Um, and so these are the most cubiclists who live in an old mining town in the north of England. There's a lot to it, it's quite complicated but I was really interested in exposing how easy it is to kind of um, hide things from view, right? So through networks you can actually just hide a whole town. You can bury a whole town as a labor dump. Um, so that was kind of the point of it. 
And then uh, this guy did this project, Transparency Grenades, 2012. Yeah, I, it's not worth checking out, really. Um, <laughs> just, it's just, just a thing. Um, uh, I left this on here for a reason, even though I knew Julian was talking, because I, I didn't know if he'd mentioned this. But what interests me about this is how it bridges the gap between the, um, the gallery and the person, right? Because, um, you know, if you, half those projects, like Mercenary Cubicles, if you went up to me and said, oh, that's amazing, is that real? I would go, no, it's a speculative object. It's a theory device. It's a, it's a prop for an idea. Whereas if you went up to Julian and asked him if the transparency grenade is real, he'd go, yeah, yeah, it is, it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here's the code and all the plans. So yeah, go and make it, it's fine, right? So that's just, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of problems with, with this, this idea, and like Anna mentioned, what's the difference we hear between design and art? And how do we bridge that gap? How do we make things that are very powerful images actually stay with people and go on to change the world? Um, which is part of my three questions that I always leave at the end of this talk. Um, yes, but is it art? Is it art? Is it? Is it? Um, what if then what? All these projects are very good at provoking ideas. They're very good at provoking us to go <gasps> and be shocked or, or, or even to laugh and, and be, you know, enjoy them. But so what? What happens next? How does that translate into change or improving the world? And then how do you measure success? This is coming up more and more as I'm teaching this stuff more and more. Is like, okay, if you design a chair, you can measure the success of that chair by how many chairs you sold. But if you're designing objects that are design objects that go in an exhibition, how are you measuring if they're having an impact, if they're, if they're doing anything? How are you actually... How are you actually forming a, uh, a quantitative way of reflecting on that? So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>